Broadway congregation in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, you, as you've seen the slides going through with some biographical information, take the time to read about some of these, these gentlemen. Uh, uh, Brother Owen has preached all over the place, done mission work in, in several areas. I noticed on, on, the, on the bio, it says he specializes in courses in the Greek New Testament. Does, does an amazing job with, with uh, in fact, kind of not, he wasn't there, but he, he taught one of the classes through his book that I was in at, at Bear Valley. And he also, he also teaches at Bear Valley on an adjunct basis and then teaches at the school in Golovko, is that right? Gorlovka, Ukraine. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> what's that? And Guatemala City, yes, sir. With works with with Heim Byron in Guatemala City. So, uh, without taking any more of, of Brother Dan's time, I will turn it over to you. But this, oh yes, now I can hear me. Very good. Let's uh, turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. You know, one of the values of a lectureship like this for me is I get to listen to other preachers and I get to learn things from them. I, I need to improve all the time on being a preacher and I like I don't use alliteration as much as some of these other guys, but when I listen to Keith, I think passion. He really preaches with passion. And he really has a way of illustrating things, putting his whole heart into it, passion. When I listen to Brother Guy Orbison, and he's such a precise speaker and thinker, I think precision. See, those two, passion and precision. And uh, I can't think of a P that describes me, except maybe poor, but uh, what I am more of is a teacher than a preacher, and I have been preaching in uh, the Broadway Church at Paducah, Kentucky for 30 years, and um, I'm trying to learn how to be a better preacher, and uh, one of the things that I do in my preaching is I teach, so today I want you to get your Bibles out. This is not going to be one of those lectures where you sit there passively it's going to be where you get your bible out and we study together that's okay with you so the book of hebrews in hebrews 13 22 is called a word of exhortation in fact the book of hebrews really isn't a letter at all it is more likely a sermon that was written down and uh, it doesn't have any like Paul's, you know, Paul and then to the church of God at Corinth. It doesn't have any of that. And it, it has minimal things at the end. And it has no epistolary form in it at all. So it's not a really a letter. It's a sermon. It's an exhortation. At least that's what it says it is in chapter 13, verse 22. And uh, it is meant for these people uh, that we call the Hebrews. The oldest manuscripts simply have... Uh, a little title on them that says Prosebrios to the Hebrews. And of course, as was pointed out by Guy, uh, we don't know who wrote it. <clears throat> the ancients, there were lots of other modern ideas, but the ancient fathers uh, had two primary candidates for the writer of Hebrews. One was Luke, the physician, and one was Barnabas, the, the companion of Paul. That uh, could be right. I know I've studied Paul in my, uh, in my studies in, for the last 45 years or so in the Greek New Testament and read Paul every day. And this writer is definitely not Paul. Because as you read the original language, it's so totally different. The phraseology, the vocabulary, the way of writing, the, the figures of speech are just not the same. I'm not saying it's inferior to Paul because... Mark was a prophet of God and not an apostle. And Luke was a prophet of God and not an apostle. And the book of Hebrews never would have been accepted as canonical had it not been also known to have been written by an inspired prophet of God, uh, even though he was not an apostle. Hebrews 10, 
19 through 39 is, is probably, of course it's not because it's my passage in the lectureship, but it's probably one of those passages in Hebrews that you might say is the heart of the epistle. Uh, you know, the message that was delivered last hour, God spoke to us by His Son, Hebrews 1, 2. Uh, it was at first spoken unto us by the Lord, Hebrews 2, 3. That's Jesus. That's the Son. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Today, if you shall hear His voice... See, that's talking about Jesus' voice. Do not harden your hearts. And then as Guy pointed out in Hebrews 12, 25, see that you do not refuse the one that is speaking. See, God has given us a message through His Son and, and He's speaking. But, you see, the thing is, these people were raised in Judaism. And they were raised in a Judaistic culture. And the temple and the sacrifices and their priests, they were very dependent upon those. And they got their security from those. And one of the words in the Old Testament that's used to describe worship, by the way, one of the most confused areas, I think, in the church today is about worship. What is worship? There are actually like 20-something different words in Hebrew and Greek that have different meanings. And English translations translate just about all of them worship. But they mean different things. And one of those in the Old Testament simply means to come near. To come near. Karav. To come near. So when man is going to worship God, he is specifically at that moment trying to come near God. He's trying to approach God. And God is holy and man is sinful. And in Judaism, there are many barriers that exist between God and man. And in order to approach God or come near to God, the worshiper has to cross through all those multiple layers and barriers until he or she gets to the, the holy place, the tabernacle or the temple, and then comes into that courtyard and in order to do that, they have to be in a state of ceremonial cleanness. And then the ones that take over, we're going to talk about this tonight, have to wear certain clothes and have a certain lineage and all those kinds of things. And then only they can go into that next to the last barrier in the tabernacle. And then only one guy, one time a year, can go through that final curtain, that final barrier that says to approach Holy God for sinful man, it's almost impossible. See. But not through Jesus. Now let's open our Bibles at Hebrews 10, and I want to show you a couple things, and then we'll come back to this. As, as the writer uh, draws this down, and he's trying to really encourage these people about being faithful. And by the way, you might note this. In the book of Hebrews, faithful is a key term. Many times, I think our translators do us a disservice because they, they translate the word believe instead of faithful. For example, uh, be careful, brethren, Hebrews 3.12, lest there be in any one of you an evil. They'll translate it unbelieving. That's not, that's not what he's saying. Lest there be in any one of you an evil, unfaithful heart. Look at the next phrase in falling away from the living God, see? So, apistone or apistois means unfaithful in the book of Hebrews. It's not because the Hebrews didn't believe in God. They did. But they were unfaithful to the God that they believed in. Now, the opposite of that, and sometimes it will say believe, is faithfulness, is hanging on. Um, in Hebrews 3.6, you have the word hold fast. In Hebrews 3.14, you have the word hold fast. In our passage, in uh, Hebrews uh, 10.23, you have hold fast. Well, see, hold fast is a synonym for the word faithful. Okay? Also in Hebrews chapter 10... 
and in Hebrews chapter 12 and numerous times in between, you have the word endurance, endurance, hupomone or hupomoneo. That word means to hang on and not give up no matter what. All this bad stuff happening all around us. And don't you believe that in our life as Christians, as we go through all the stuff we go through, that sometimes we just, we're just so beat down, we're so tired, and all we can do is just hang on. But endurance is the same thing as holding fast, is the same thing as being faithful. Now, these are not my words. These are the words of the writer of Hebrews. Uh, there are some others, and we're going to talk about them in this, but uh, if, you'll, if you'll notice in our little text here, I want you to kind of underline or circle in verse 19 the word confidence or boldness, however yours translates it. Boldness or confidence, having then confidence, enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. How many of you have confidence there? Boldness? Anybody? Okay. It, it means that... We, we believe that we can do this, and not because of our own goodness, but because of the work of Christ. But that word confidence is also in another key touchstone passage. Back in chapter 4, verse 16. Look at chapter 4, verse 16. In fact, it's very much tied to the passage we're studying here. He says, let us draw near, therefore, with confidence or boldness to the throne of grace. And so in our passage, having then confidence to enter into the holy place. Now, how do you draw near to God? Don't you have to come to the holy place? Don't you eventually, if you're the priest, have to enter into the holy place to draw near to God? You'll notice there in 4.16, he says, let us draw near. And if you notice in uh, Hebrews 10, 22, in our passage, he comes back to that in this passage. And he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. So he said back in 416 that we need to draw near with confidence. And then in the intervening passages, he explained why we can have such a tremendous confidence. Not because of us, not because I'm good enough to draw near, but because of the work of Jesus, the great high priest. That's why we can have confidence to draw near. See, my confidence is not in me, it's in Jesus Christ. Then if you'll notice uh, in 4.14, <clears throat> 4.14, Having then a great priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us do what? Let's hold fast our confession. But then if you go back to Hebrews 10 in the, in the passage that we're studying here right now, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope so that it does not waver. Now, waver is the opposite of holding fast, see? It's the opposite of being faithful, see? So, 4, 14, hold fast the confession. 10, 23, hold fast the confession. 4, 16, let us draw near. 10, 22, let us draw near. 4, 6, 4 14, excuse me. Yeah, 4, 16, let us draw near with confidence, and 1019, since then we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, it might just be my imagination, but it seems pretty obvious to me that the writer is coming back to where he started there in 4, 14 through 16. And he's coming back and driving the point home in the passage that we're dealing with here in Hebrews chapter 10. So, I forgot I brought me a PowerPoint. So, here, here's the way the structure of our passage is. I'm always into how is a passage built? What is the structure? There are one, two, three, four, five imperatives in the passage. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. 
So this is how it's structured. You've got let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us consider. Remember the former days and do not throw away our confidence. By the way, that's that same word confidence that he started out with in verse 19. There he says, having then great confidence. Okay. So really the bottom line is that bottom statement there in 1035, I think it is. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, but you have need of endurance. So that having done the will of God, you may receive the things that are promised. See? So the opposite of being faithful would be throwing away your confidence. See, I have, I have known many people who have been so devastated by the struggles of life that they simply had no more confidence that God loved them or that Christ was real or that that Christianity was the answer, and they threw away their confidence, and they turned their back on God. <clears throat> now, um, let's read this passage, at least part of it here, beginning with verse 19, and we'll study a little bit more. Having, therefore, brothers, confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus... Through that new and living way that he inaugurated for us through the curtain, that is his flesh. Now, when it says that is his flesh, it's not talking about the curtain. <clears throat> it's talking about the way through the curtain. How do you get through the curtain so that there's no longer any barrier between God and me? The only way through that curtain was the body of Christ. Go back to 10.5. 10.5. When he came into the world, he said, you really didn't want those sacrifices and offerings because verse 4 says they could never take away sin. See? Those burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin you didn't take any pleasure in, but a what you prepared for me? A body you prepared for me. Then I said, behold, I come, in the role of the book that is written about me, forget that part, that's a parenthesis, then I come to do your will, O God. So you don't, you don't really want those sacrifices and burnt offerings, so I, Jesus, have come to do your will, O God. All right? Then he says in verse 9 that he took away those sacrifices and offerings, he took away the first things to establish the second. That's not saying... He took away the first covenant to establish the second covenant there. It's saying it, he took away those first sacrifices to establish the second sacrifice, which is the body of Jesus. And if you look at verse 10, by which will, see, that's the will of God. If you go back up to the quote, I have come to do your will, O God, by which will we have been sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So what's the way through the curtain? <clears throat> well, it's his flesh, his body, that was the once for all sacrifice for us. All right, so look here at verse 21. And having a great priest over the house of God. Now, I love it when the writer tells me what he's been talking about, because I try to figure out what he's talking about. And then if he just flat out tells me, I love it. But if you go back to chapter 8, verse 1, this covers everything between 4.14 and 8.1. And he says here, thank you, writer, the chief point of everything I've been saying, oh, way to go, the chief point of everything I've been saying is this, we do have such a high priest who sat down on the, high, high, uh, on the right hand of God. Well, okay, I thought that's what you were talking about. But <clears throat> when you go back here to chapter 10, He's already established that, verse 21. So he says, having a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Now see, force of that is, I'm trusting so much in Jesus and the work of Jesus, and because he is my high priest, high priest that because of all that, I'm going to draw near. I'm going to draw near to God through Jesus. Not like my Jewish forefathers, but... Through Jesus. That's how I'm going to connect with God. Through Jesus. Period. See? So let us, 
as opposed to them, draw near, see, with a true heart, means a sincere heart, see, not a half and half heart, not a heart that has one foot back in Judaism and doesn't really know if he trusts Jesus or not, but with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having all my trust in the sacrifice of Jesus, all my trust in the redemptive work of Jesus. <clears throat> heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. If you go back through chapters 9 and 10 and you look at all that sprinkling in there, it was always blood that was being sprinkled. And see that high priest once a year on Yom Kippur in Leviticus 16, he would take those sacrifices and he would enter into the Holy of Holies and he would stand between those two cherubim and the great Ark of the Covenant and he would sprinkle the blood of those sacrifices. See? Notice it says having our hearts See, the heart is the mind, the conscience, the soul. Having our hearts sprinkled, what are they sprinkled with? The blood of Jesus Christ. See, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience while our bodies are washed in pure water. Well, when we're baptized in the pure waters of baptism, that's when God is sprinkling clean or Jesus is sprinkling clean our hearts through his blood. See? And <clears throat> so our hearts are sprinkled while our bodies are washed with pure water. And then he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now this word hope is, <clears throat> is used a number of times and the confession is used a number of times. But remember, 3.6, you know, Moses was faithful. Jesus was faithful as a son whose household we are, if indeed we hold fast. 3.14, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast. 3.14. Here again, he says, hold fast. See, hold fast the confession of our hope. But I want to show you another one. Flip back to 7.19. <clears throat> 7.19. The law didn't make anything complete, but... Another hope, a better hope, was brought in through which we do what? Draw near to God. That better hope is in the better sacrifice of Jesus. It's in the better priesthood of Jesus. And because we put all of our trust in that, that's why we confidently draw near to God and say, God, I can... I can connect with you. I can have a saving relationship with you. I trust in this. I believe in this. I have confidence in this because of the work of Jesus Christ. So he says, let us draw near and let us uh, hold fast the confession of our hope un unswervingly, some translations say. Some translations say so that doesn't waver for he is faithful who promised in Hebrews 10, 11, etc., Faithfulness, listen to me, really not faith, but faithfulness is always connected to the promises of God. Because if I so believe in the promises, I'm, I'm willing to do anything so that I might obtain those promises. And faithfulness is not thinking, it's doing Read the faith chapter, which I call the faithfulness chapter. And it's about what people did through faithfulness. See? And it's, it, they kept doing until the very end. And then as that chapter ends, uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> All right? So then you've got these three things here. The third one is let's consider one another. How does considering each other... Tie into faithfulness. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, Brant there, and I have a good friend in Paducah, Kentucky. By the way, Brant, wave at him. Brant is a relatively new member of the Linda Road Church of Christ. And if you haven't met him, he was baptized, he and his wife, at the Broadway Church in Paducah. And they're now coming here. But Brant and I have a good friend, and his name is Steve Davis. Steve Davis, many times in my 30 years at Broadway, has kept me going by coming up to me and putting his arms around me and hugging me and saying, Brother, 
I love you. I appreciate you. Don't be discouraged. Just hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. Now, go back to 3.12, just a minute. Chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brothers, lest there be in any one of you an evil, Dan says, unfaithful heart in falling away from the living God. But, on the other hand, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And if that happens, we're no longer going to be what? Faithful. Okay? So we've got to have the encouragement of each other in order to remain faithful. Why do we come to church? How many people have I heard say to me, or, or say in church services, Dear Lord, we know that the only reason we've come together today is to worship God. Uh-uh. Nope. No. That is not true. That is not biblical. There are two things that God wants to happen every time God's people come together. One of those things is edification or a horizontal encouragement of one another. And the other thing is vertical. It's worship. We don't just come together to worship. We come together to worship and to encourage one another. In fact, in our passage, the, the most prominent feature of why he's telling them to come together is for the encouragement of each other. How am I going to hold fast my confession? How am I going to keep my confidence? How am I going to continue to draw near to God through Jesus Christ without the encouragement of my brothers and sisters? Lest I have an unfaithful heart. So he says, encourage or consider one another. Verse 24. Don't just think about yourself. What about Clayton and how he's struggling? What about Brant and how he's struggling? What about Clint and how he's struggling? What about how they need me to put my arm around them and give them a lift so that they keep going? See, if we all just think about ourselves and we come in the back door and we come to our rented pew, you know, and we sit down and we just get real quiet and we just wait for everybody to get in. We just talk to anybody else. That's selfish, brothers, sisters. God told us that when we come together, and I think the coming together starts when you see each other in the parking lot. When we come together, we're supposed to encourage one another. In fact, we're supposed to consider one another. That means give it some thought as to how we might provoke one another to love and good deeds. How can I encourage Brant? To love and good deeds. How can I encourage Clint to love and good deeds? What do I need to do for sister so-and-so because she's having a hard time to encourage her to love and good deeds? What can I do to this person who thinks nobody cares about them and I could go put a hand on them and help them be faithful and encourage them to love and good deeds? See, that's what he's saying. Now notice the word not there is the opposite of considering one another. The, the command is us consider one another in order to provoke unto love and good deeds. Not, see, not would be the opposite of thinking about one another. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. If I'm doing that, I'm not considering my brothers and sisters. I'm only thinking about myself. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but encouraging one another. See? So I'm considering my brothers and sisters in order to encourage them so that they will remain what? Faithful. That's exactly right. And then he says in verse 26, and no, I'm not going to talk about the see the day approaching because I don't care. Um, that doesn't matter to what I'm talking about. Destruction of Jerusalem, have it your way. Jesus coming, I don't care. But that's not the heart of the passage. All right. But then you have, if you look at our little PowerPoint, Simple is good. You have this parenthetical statement about what happens if we don't remain faithful. What if we do fall away from God? Like Hebrews 3.13 says. What if we go on sinning willfully? In the book of Hebrews, I like context. Do y'all? In, in the book of Hebrews, to go on sinning willfully would mean to keep turning back on Jesus. A guy mentioned chapter 6, 
And in chapter 6, verse 6, I think it is, he said that it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance since, why is it impossible? Since they go on crucifying the Son of God all over again, and they go on openly shaming Him. Well, if they go on crucifying Him, that's like rejecting Him all over again. If they go on openly shaming Him, that's turning their back on Jesus. See? Now take chapter 6, verse 6, where it says, if we go on crucifying the Son of God, and if we go on putting Him to an open shame, and compare that with 1029. Are we studying in our Bibles or just listening? If we go to 1029, of how much sore punishment shall he be judged worthy who have trampled underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified an unholy thing and despised the Spirit of grace? Now you tell me, is there any difference in crucifying all over again the Son of God and openly shaming him in 6 6 and trampling underfoot the Son of God? Uh, counting the blood of the covenant an unholy thing and despising the spirit of grace in 1029. Does he not come right back to the same thing? Exactly. Exactly. These books tie together. Okay. So 1029, if you'll pardon me, describes the willful sin. The willful sin is laid out for you in 1029. Are you with me or not? So if we go on doing the things that 1029 describes in more detail... There remains no more a sacrifice for sin. God only has one for us, and that's Jesus. And if I turn my back on Jesus, there's no other sacrifice for sins that God is going to send, uh, going to send for me. So what does remain? Only a certain, that means it's absolutely for sure, fearful expectation and fierceness of fire which shall devour the adversaries. You don't have Jesus, you're going to hell. For, you know, if, they, if those that denied uh, Moses' law got punished this way, verse 28, of how much sorer punishment shall he be judged worthy, verse 29, who does those three things, all right? So verse 26, all down through um, verse uh, 31, is a warning against falling away from God. Then you've got in 32 and following... Remember what you've got invested in this thing. You remember all the stuff you've suffered to be a Christian? I mean, go back through your life. How many times did you get it out when you were so low spiritually and all this stuff was happening in your family, all this stuff was happening uh, in your world, and you, you, hang, you hung on to Christ, you held fast, if you want to use the terminology of, of the book of Hebrews, and you've been through all these wars and all these years and all this stuff... Would you throw all of, all of it away now after having gone all through all of that in order to stay faithful to God? That's basically what he's saying here. So you get down to verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great promise of reward. But you have need of endurance, meaning the same thing as faithfulness, see? You have need of endurance so that having done the will of God, doesn't that phrase, having done the will of God, doesn't that describe faithfulness? So that having done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. And then he says, for yet a little while, and he that cometh will come and will not delay. Well, who's, who are we expecting to come? Jesus, see? And then he says, and I want you to look here in, in 1038, and my righteous one will live by faith. Now, let me show you what the Hebrew writer does with Habakkuk 2, verse 3 and 4. It's interesting what different writers in the New Testament do with this same passage of Scripture. Paul and this guy do it a little differently. <clears throat> but in, uh, <clears throat> in this passage, he's saying that soon Jesus is going to come. And when Jesus does finally come, the righteous will live. Brother Dan doesn't translate it by faith. Guess how he translates it? By faithfulness. Then look at the next phrase. But if he shrinks back. Now see, shrinking back is the opposite of faithfulness. 
See, in, 10, in 1036, he says you have need endurance. See, that's another way of saying faithfulness. So my righteous one, when Jesus comes, if, if you're going to live and stand successfully before Jesus, it'll be because of faithfulness. Underline the, the phrase, and you'll have it in your Bible, is by faith in, in 1038. You knew that by faith there in that quotation is where the by faith comes from and throughout chapter 11. Because all the by faiths in chapter 11 are based on that quote in 1038. That means when Jesus comes and he sees you, if you're one of his righteous ones, you will live in the presence of the returned Jesus if you've been faithful. See, so I would translate almost all of those by faiths in chapter 11 as by faithfulness. See, by faithfulness, Noah, when he was warned of God concerning things not seen as yet, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. See, and you also notice there, for example, if you go down to um, verse 4. By faithfulness, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice to God than Cain. Watch it now. And it was, he had witness born to him that he was what? What? Righteous. All right. Now take the word righteous there in Hebrews 11, 4. Draw a little line back up to 1038. That says the what shall live by faith? The righteous shall live by faith. By faith. And then if you go down to um, 11.7. By faith, Noah being warned of God concerning, con concerning things not seen as yet, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, and by it condemned the world, and he became an heir of the, watch it now, the righteousness that is by faith. Righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. And you'll find this scattered throughout chapter 11, which shows that the entire chapter 11 is hitting off of chapter 10, verse 38, about righteousness that really only comes through faithfulness. You're considered righteous, not if you're perfect, but if you're faithful. See, faithful is not the same as perfect. But faithful means you don't give up. Faithful means you hold fast. Faithful means you endure. Now, I'm doing like Guy, and I've, I've preached just a little bit of my lesson, but I'm, tr I'm trying to teach more than I'm trying to preach here. So let me give you, let me give you how I would apply some of this in a, in a local church setting. <clears throat> um, in the book of Hebrews, there's much said about faithfulness in regard to the condition of somebody's heart. There are mindsets, there are attitudes that contribute to being faithful. Um, a faithful heart is an attentive heart. We talked about this in the last session a little bit. You know, you ought to pay the more careful attention to the things that you've heard. That is, the things you've heard through Jesus. Lest perhaps you drift away from them. There's so many things vying for our attention. You know, there's our kids and our jobs and our sports and our Facebook and the stuff we're going to do on our house and that little Korean guy if he's going to launch missiles and politics and all this other stuff. But if we're going to be faithful over the long haul, we've got to put our attention on Jesus and keep it there. See, uh, faithful hearts are not distracted hearts. These are a group of young people listening to me on Sunday morning and... Uh, they are just thinking about their boyfriends and their girlfriends. And, no, I'm kidding. What they're going to do tonight and their tests they got tomorrow and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but faithful hearts are not distracted hearts. In Hebrews 3 verse 10, when he's talking about the Israelites, God says, I was angry with this generation and I said they do always go astray in their hearts. Well, distracted hearts that aren't paying attention to Jesus and God's word they're straying hearts. And straying hearts are not faithful hearts. Faithful hearts are focused on living for Jesus. They're focused on their relationship with God. So if we allow our hearts to be distracted, they're not going to be faithful. This actor is giving us that really good look that says, I'm not buying whatever you're selling. 
I'm very reluctant. Have you ever had a, a, a teenager maybe that you're trying to talk to and they are not listening to one word you are trying to say to them? Or maybe you're trying to have a Bible study with somebody and there's just no, there, nothing's clicking. They're just very reluctant to listen to anything you're saying. Well, this word that we have in these two passages, and they were mentioned this morning, in, in 511, he's trying to tell them about Jesus and how he's the high priest after Melchizedek, and they are dull of hearing, he says. The word is nothroi. Nothroi really means hesitant. It means reluctant. And by the way, it's the same word in 612 that is translated sluggish. That's also nothroi. What he really means here is these people were hesitant. They were, they were slow. They were reluctant to really accept Jesus and embrace him with both hands. They were so tied to their traditions and their Judaism, like monkey that swings from the tree with holding one vine, you know. And then all of a sudden he reaches out his little foot slash hand and he grabs another vine. But he got to let go of the first vine <laughs> if he's going to get anywhere and grab hold of the second vine with two hands, right? These people were reluctant to hear what the Hebrews writer was saying about Christ in the Old Testament. They were hesitant to buy that. They were reluctant to grab Jesus with both hands and put all their eggs in the Jesus basket. See? And so that's what this word reluctant, hesitant means. A faithful heart is not a reluctant, hesitant heart. A faithful heart is grabbing Jesus with both hands. Okay? A faithful heart is not a hardened heart. This guy doesn't want any part of it. He's not just reluctant, he's hardened. Hebrews 3, 7, Today, if you shall hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Isn't it interesting that in 3, 7, he says, do not harden your hearts. In 3, 10, God says, they, were, they went astray in their hearts. And then in 3, 12, he says, you be careful that there's not in any one of you an evil, unfaithful heart. An unfaithful heart is a straying heart, a hardened heart. Am I making a bad conclusion there? Seems like that comes right out of the text, okay? All right, a faithful heart is a diligent heart. In 4.11, see, diligence is when you're really engaged. You're, you're, you're busy with it. You're, you're putting effort into it, energy into it. Let us therefore be diligent. Let us give diligence. Some translations will say, let us make every effort. It's spudazzo. Let us make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall after the same example of disobedience. Well, what example of disobedience? The example in chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts as they did in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tried me by tested me and saw my works 40 years. But I was angry with this generation, and I said, they do always go astray in their hearts. They do not know my ways. And so I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. Okay? He's talking about that passage in this passage. He says, instead of doing like they did, they left Egypt with diligence. Oh, man, let's get out of here. Let's get through that Red Sea. They put all their stuff into it. But they didn't keep that diligence. Let's be all about going to the land of Canaan. See? So a diligent heart, an engaged heart, is going to be a faithful heart. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end. Hebrews 6, verse 11. Another passage. Faithful hearts are confident hearts. We talked about this word confidence in several passages in, in Hebrews. Let us draw near with confidence. Again, our confidence is in the, the redemptive work of Jesus. Hebrews 10, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. I find so many Christians, I don't know about you other preachers, but they just lose their confidence in the Lord. They, they, they're not really sure that they really believe it anymore. They're not really sure that they have confidence in Jesus. What I see over and over again is they have no confidence in themselves and they're trusting in themselves instead of God. 
but they just get hopeless because they lose, lose that confidence. And if you show me a person, a Christian, that's trying to be a Christian and has no confidence, I'll show you a Christian that's about to fall away from God if they're not very, very careful. See, it's very, very important. Do not throw away your confidence in our passage. It will be richly rewarded. And a faithful heart is not shrinking back or being fe fearful, but one that's trudging forward because it's trusting in the Lord. <clears throat> faithful hearts are determined hearts. Um, see, I, t I tell my preacher students, see this last part of what I'm teaching you here, this is a sermon. This is for the people that, that struggle all week with their kids and, and they've, they're struggling with their job and they're tired on Sunday morning and, and they come and they want something that will build them up. I'm not going to go through all the details of all these passages in Hebrews for them because that mom with those little babies crawling all over and getting sticky Cheerio stuff all over and everything, she's not ready to do that. But the overflow of all that, the, 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 the takeaway from all of that is these points in this sermon, which click real well with the mom that's struggling with the little kids and with the dad that's working two jobs and all that kind of stuff. All right? So faithful hearts are determined. You have need of endurance. How determined are you to be a Christian? I, I, like many of you, I've given my whole life to preaching the gospel. I've given my whole life to trying to do right, to trying to lead others to the Lord. I am absolutely determined that no matter what happens, I'm going to see it through to the end. I'm determined. And I think that the quality of endurance has to do with determination. And in chapter 12, that great crowd of witnesses is the, all the faithful people that he tells you about in chapter 11. It says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. When I started high school football in 10th grade, we had a fresh out of the Marine Corps drill instructor that was our coach. And he introduced me to a brand new concept. We ran like three or four miles or five in the morning, you know, early in the morning. And I, Mama's little boy started running. Mama's little boy got to running with the pack about a mile out or something like that or a mile and a half. Mama's little boy was sucking eggs. Mama's, Mama's little boy started puking up his eggs and bacon. Mama's little boy thought that if you're puking your eggs and bacon, that means you can stop. Marine Corps instructor with his boot in my rear end determined that you can puke while you're running. <laughs> that was a new idea to me. Yeah. I had never even thought about the fact that if I was in distress, I could overcome that distress and puke while running. Christians have to be people who can puke while running. <laughs> Christians have to be people who even when their life is coming apart, they say, I will not quit, I will not give up, I will not stop, my back is aching, my hip joints are hurting me, my, my, my side is aching, but I will not quit, I will keep going, see? That is the attitude of 1036, you have need of endurance, and 12.1, see? You have need of endurance. And it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, listen, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. So endurance is the characteristic of a determined heart. And then finally, and don't you love those blessed words <laughs> from any preacher? Finally, all the songbooks start coming up. <laughs> Mama starts putting up the Cheerios, you know. Finally, faithful hearts are encouraged hearts. And we've looked at these passages, Hebrews 3.13. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. By the way, the today there in 13 and several times through there goes back to verse 7 where he says, Today, if you shall hear his voice, do not harden his heart. So, Encourage one another daily, so long as it's called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is so deceitful. 
Satan gets so many of us. We need each other so desperately. I need people. You need people. We've got to consider each other and encourage people. Now, this is one of my favorite passages. Don't have, you tell me when we're supposed to stop, okay? We don't have time to really explore it. But let me turn over this passage real quickly. In the sixth chapter of, of Hebrews, the writer introduces us to two things that make Christianity absolutely has to be true. The first one was the promise to Abraham. And in Genesis 22, 17 and 18, which is kind of alluded to there in, in part of the passage, he said, in your seed, in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So somehow, through the seed of Abraham, which we know was Jesus Christ, all the nations, not just the Jewish nation, were going to be blessed. So there's a promise. It's an unequivocal promise. It doesn't say, if this happens, then in Abraham's seed, all nations will be blessed. God just said, in Abraham's seed, no conditions, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, that's, that's predestination. That is the eternal purpose of God that's going to happen. You and I can't stop it from happening. Okay? But then when you come down to, uh, what is it, verse... Uh, let me get back to my text here. Verse uh, 17, I think it is. It talks about... Uh, God who interposed with an oath. Now that word interposed means he added. He added an oath. Okay? What did he add it to? He added it to the promise to Abraham. So we already had the promise to Abraham that said, In thy seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But now God is going to add something else. He interposed with an oath. Now here's where a lot of people, I think, miss this text. They think context is the three or four verses previous. No. Context is from Hebrews 1, 1 up to this point. And so if you go back to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, Just as Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but he who said to him, the one who said to him, You are my son, today have I begotten you, also said in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, from the beginning of Hebrews all the way through, God is hammering at a scripture. It is Psalm 110, verses 1 and 4. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until you make your enemies your footstool. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110, verse 4 says, the Lord has sworn. Well, if we swear, we're taking a what? Oh, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the kicker about Psalm 110, and I'll retread this about two minutes worth tonight, is that the passage says that there's somebody who's David's Lord that's going to be seated as king, who is also going to be made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you really feel the, the, the power of that, kings came from the tribe of Judah. And priests came from the tribe of Levi. So how in the world can that be? So if you put the promise to Abraham, in thy seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed, together with that oath in Psalm 110, that the same one I'm going to make king, I'm going to make a priest forever. If those two things are true, then Christianity has to be true. It has to be all made true in Jesus. And that's why he says... There are two unchangeable things. God's promise to Abraham and God's oath to make Jesus a high priest. Those two unchangeable things give us a strong encouragement that Christianity is really, truly the eternal plan of God, that it has to be true, see? And he says, so that we can hold fast, hold fast as a synonym for being faithful, see? We can hold fast to our hope, see? So, uh, encouragement from really trusting in Jesus. And then we already talked about encouraging one another in this passage. <clears throat> like I said, I'm not nearly as much of a preacher as a teacher, but I hope this will bless your life. I hope this will help you to think about uh, being faithful and what it takes to be faithful. 
God bless you, and hopefully we'll talk later. <clears throat>